Welcome to the critical zone. Thanks that you are involved and participating in our program. Thank you that I can be your guest in your homes. This is possible thanks to our Ted Candim and our sponsors, which have been mentioned. Before I pass the word to Bruno Latour, who, as you know, is one of the most influential thinkers in our time, who is at the moment the most cited French philosopher. And Bruno, he has conceived the catalog at the exhibition, Critical Zones, together with me and some co-curators, which have been named already. Before I ask Bruno and request him to explain us the title, Critical Zone, and the theme and the subject of our exhibition, I would like to comment why we have chosen a new way of opening a virtual Venezuela and a streaming festival for three days and for three nights. Yeah. With lectures, films, uh, guided digital tours, live conversations, and your participation. Yeah. You can study this program, as you have already explained, uh, in our website. The reason why we cannot be present tonight and today uh, together in one space is that that can is naturally the coronavirus, which prohibits traveling, travels, and transportation in the name of so-called social distancing. That means we have to keep a distance. Uh, we cannot be body next to body in one space together. Uh, and therefore, uh, this social distancing is precisely uh, my question. How can we communicate uh, uh, in, dis in distance, uh, at distance? And my answer is precisely, uh, we can, as you see tonight, we can communicate by using distance technology. The Greek word for distance, for far, is tele. And since the middle of the 19th century, we have developed a new technology, which is called telefax, telephone, television, radio, internet. These are all technologies which can trans triumph over distance. Uh, they can banish distance. So we are living in a society of teletechnology, in a tele society, since many, many decades. Uh, and today we can use this teletechnology so that they can communicate without proximity, without face to face. Uh, this is my answer to the crisis. Uh, with this technology, see, uh, something happened in the history of mankind which has never taken place before. The first time. The message and the messenger have been separated. Normally, a message needs a messenger, the boat of a messenger, a person who brings the message, a boat, a bird, a car, or a plane. But now, yeah, the message is separated from the messenger. The message can travel by cable or by electromagnetic waves. They don't need the presence of a carrier, of a bodily carrier. This is what is happening and possible today. Yeah. Therefore, yeah, we can start a new way uh, to look at audiences. We have to learn we have different kind of audiences. We have an audience which is locally bound in one place, like in a theater, like in a museum, like in a cinema. But with telecommunication, we've learned we also address a non-local audience, which is not bound to one place, which is dispersed, distributed in many places. So we have the cinema with local audience, and the theater, and the museum, and the concert hall. And we have also the non-local audiences in television, and radio, etc. You give an example with a singer. 100 feet years ago, a singer had to meet people in a concert hall. So the message, the song, and the message, the singer have been together. And today, the singer is at home. You are at home, yeah? nobody is moving, nobody is traveling, but we can still hear his message and so on. And this is precisely the future yeah? of the museum and also the future of television. Therefore, I think yeah, that all the sports stadium, all these concert halls, yeah, all the cinemas are the graves as far as of the future. Look at the sports stadium, look at sports event. You have thousands locally bound audience, but the true audience is behind the houses in front of the screen looking as non-local audience. And who pays for the sport events? It is television because of the non-local audience. So all these events take place, in fact, already for the non-local audiences because they pay for it. Therefore, it is very clear uh, that we are not 
in a ghost situation. When now sport events take place in a so-called ghost, ghost audience, it's not true. We have real visitors, but it's real visitors at home in front of the TV screen. Therefore, huh? what, we, what we see tonight is that a museum with locally bound audience is turned into a uh, radio station, to a television station, to a broadcasting station. What we do the next days is a great experiment uh, to turn a museum for local audiences. In addition, we do not dissolve the old museum. In addition, we turn the museum into a, a broadcasting institution for non-local audiences. Huh? So it means you at home, huh? and you have you are working in your home office. Now we are your home museum coming to you, since you cannot come to us. So it means uh, that camp was always open. We have only been close to the local audience. We have been open, we showed films, for example, 500 years of film and composers, we showed films by the Bauhaus. So we have been always open and streaming. Uh, so we don't follow this old-fashioned word, a museum was not open, it was open all the time. Uh, and this is very important. It is no uh, a coincidence. It is, in fact, a very true civilian incident that we have now, the coronavirus crisis, at the same time, the much more dangerous crisis of the climate. Yeah? And that we can this bundle together tonight yeah, is a very important uh, opportunity, because both the climate crisis and the corona crisis shows us how fragile our life is and how difficult it has become to survive. Yeah? This is precisely the subject of the show. Planet Earth is a patient. Huh? And what do you do with a patient? You control his blood pressure, you control his organs, you, you, you control his, the organization of his bodily function. This is precisely what the scientists do with the critical zones. They control the critical state of the Earth, the skin of the Earth, the surface of the Earth. Huh? And this is precisely huh, what Bruno Dürer is teaching us since many years. Television huh, promises you we love to entertain you. This is another word for saying we love to idiotize you. Television wants you to turn into idiots. We know. We want you to know. We want you to know where you live, on what ground you live, and from what you live. What are the conditions of living on this planet? This is the aim, of, in my opinion, of this show. And Bruno Latour, following the guy who believes of James Lovelock, following the endobiotic processes, this kind of self-regulating loops of the Earth, the ideas of um, Lynn Margulis, he reformulated them yeah, together with the scientific critical zone. And this is now why I soon pass the word to Bruno. At the end, I want to say the following. Huh? Bruno had made a prophetic sentence in his book, Face, Facing Gaia 2013. He spoke about immunology. Yeah, yeah, and he said, no immunology, no immunology is possible without high sensitivity to those multiple controversial entangled loops. Those who are not quick to detect or respond to slight changes are doomed. And those who, for some reasons, interrupt, erase, background, diminish, weaken, deny, obscure, underfund, and disconnect any of those loops which hold stable in a kind of homeostasis, the living processes. Huh? If these people these people are not only insensitive and unresponsive. They are simply criminal. And therefore, according to Latour, we need a new earthly politics. And in the next days, we'll show you legendary scientists like Donna Haraway, uh, Nobel Prize winners like David Riss, uh, and a, a row of competent, prominent, and eminent scientists who will explain us in discussions and contributions, visually wonderful films we will introduce in the state of the Earth uh, now. And please, Bruno, now uh, continue and explain us why we have this title, what is the subject of the show, according to your several years long researches. Please, Bruno. Many thanks. Uh, Peter, I have to say that in spite of Peter enthusiasm about the virtual scenography that he beautifully imagined here, I miss the real 3D space because the whole idea of the show initially was to land on Earth, not to download ourselves in the cloud, but the virus actually struck us and decided otherwise. You might be surprised by the word critical zone because it doesn't mean much except we know that we are in a crisis and, and we are. 
The subtitle of the show is what we are really after, as uh, Ika and Peter uh, mentioned. Observatories, so we are going to see observatory and to become ourselves observatory for earthly politics. Politics is always about humans, but now it's about Earth as well. And we are not exactly sure how we go from a politics of humans to uh, a politics uh, of the earth. And that's what the, the show is about. I got the idea by linking two different things. One, as many of you, I'm sure, is the sort of disappointment that the ecological politics is not taking up, so to speak. We don't have an ecological movement, even if things are better now, thanks to the virus, which are at the scale of the phenomena we are supposed to counteract. So we, we always, those who are interested in earthly politics, uh, worry about the lack of uh, involvement. And I prepare this show for two years with a remarkable group of students uh, at the HFJ, which is the school just by what I was going to say here, but it's actually <laughs> in another space near ZKM where Peter is difficult to find its way uh, in the virtual space. <clears throat> and the other thing is the link with a scientist whom I met. To my great surprise, they call themselves critical zone specialists. And I had no idea what it meant. They had no idea that the word critical in philosophy and sociology, and especially in Germany, has a very complicated uh, meaning. They just use this concept to bring together all sorts of specialists working on the thin skin of the earth. And I was very uh, <laughs> surprised, I have to say, because I didn't realize that uh, we were not knowing, we didn't know as much as I thought about the earth. We know a lot about the globe. We know a lot about the cosmos. We know a lot about all sorts of uh, entities. But actually, when you want to ask how much do we know about the tiny, tiny, tiny few kilometers up and few kilometers down skin on which everything which we experience is actually there. There is no other experience we ever had. We human, we plants, we uh, earthworms <laughs> and inside this little, little tiny critical zone. They mention, to my great surprise, Two important things. One, other specialists, geologists, biologists, uh, physicists, uh, cosmologists are not so much interested in representing this very superficial little skin. So that was a great paradox. Everything we live in is on the skin, but it's not the center of a scientific discipline. That's why they had to invent it, the critical zone. So it's not exactly a concept, it's a, it's a way to gather many different disciplines together. Now, I was, of course, putting the two things I mentioned together. One, why don't we have a politics which are the scale of the Earth? The other thing, these people were studying and the Earth, but only the thin skin, and telling me we don't know much about it. That's why they built observatories. Observatories, as you will see in a minute, a very highly equipped spot of the Earth in order to understand the dynamic. And I told them, but we, we, we know the dynamic. I mean, all those sciences are centuries old. And they said, no, no. Every little spot, the complexity of the Earth reaction is actually amazing. And they many times told me the following. When you enter into a hospital, when you are in uh, the uh, emergency room, Immediately, you are equipped with lots of instruments. Immediately, hundreds of variables are being clicking on instrument. I hope not too many people had this experience. So there is, an, for the human body, a whole gamut of instruments and a whole tradition of observatories and an immense industry behind. But then I ask, what about the Earth? What about the skin of the Earth? They say, well, we don't have that many instruments. We are costly. We are not so well developed. And we are not that many observatories. So I realized the complete 
strangeness of a situation. It's very important to understand the body. It's very important to be with the uh, emergency room. But what about the emergency room of the earth? And that why what you are going to see during the three days and <laughs> in real space during the few months is a range of scientists working on those different problems in terms of politics, in terms of science, through, in many cases, the uh, mediation uh, of art. I'm not going now to get into the scientific details because we have assembled, especially tonight, many uh, scientists whom I call in a friendly way, critical zonists, even though it's not their word, it's, it's my word. And you will me see as time goes, and especially if you read the catalog, how many influence it has on the definition of politics. Peter said before that it was, a, or I think it was Ica, that it's a world changing exhibition. <laughs> I'm not sure it's that great, but why not? Certainly, the task of a critical zonist and the task of a critical zone exhibition has something which has the same size as what happened when in the 16th and 17th century, the discovery of America and the scientific revolution forced the whole political, religious, artistic, economic, scenography and collective life to change. And the fact, of course, that we are trying to show, show really in the show, <laughs> virtual and real, is this change. A new change where we have to become earthly. We have to land. We have to become what I call terrestrial. And it is an incredible change because we were supposed to move out of nature. We were supposed to move off. We were supposed to escape the gravity of nature. And as Peter mentioned, Jim Lovelock, the discoverer of Gaia with Margulis, and I'm sorry to make the bad pun, but Lovelock is actually Lovelockin. We are locking, that's his discovery. We are locked in the Gaia thin skin of the earth, and we are not escaping anywhere else. We are not going uh, in the cloud, and the cloud, as you know, the digital cloud is actually firmly material and cost of a lot of electricity. I have no idea how much electricity this three days show will cost. So the whole idea is looking Gaia with Peter. looking downward. The whole idea is to look Love downward looking. and to become locked in and to accept the fact that we are locked in, not in the bad way that we have been in in the last two months, but in this new, in a way, exhilarating new world as exhilarating as it was in the 16th century and 17th century, but very different. And that's the task, a huge task, as you see. But I've done four exhibitions in ZKM. That's the fourth one. And I know that when you ask ZKM team to do something, they do it. <laughs> Whatever you ask, they do it. So I'm sure they will succeed. And it's a great pleasure to be with Peter Weibel and all of you in the virtual reality tonight. Thank you very much. Before we start our next program, I would say what you mentioned is very interesting. I think it's a significant coincidence, the climate crisis and the corona crisis, because all the vocabulary like lock, uh, lockdown, shutdown, lock in, yeah, is precisely the situation what we already have. Yeah? So there's this famous song, people don't hear the signals. And I think now is a moment when people don't hear the signals uh, that this earth in a crisis. Uh, and therefore, we have to make the show and we can hope that the show and your catalog will change the politics. Uh, because it's, I find it very interesting that the parallelity, simultaneity of the vocabulary. Uh. Our next point uh, is, as Bruno said, uh, the science of critical zones is a chain of observatories worldwide. Uh. And Bruno Du has selected a special uh, observatory, which is called Strengbach Catchment Environmental Observatory, which is uh, 150 kilometers distant from Karlsruhe in France. Yeah. Two artists, Alexandre Arén and Sohail Hajibaba, together with Marie Claire Perret, have made a film about this observatory. Yeah. We will show you the film and discuss the film because it is important to understand 
the museum, the show, the situation will also be an observatory. We don't want visitors like tourists coming around and look at the art historical trophies. No, we want visitors who come in to study, to learn something, and to learn something which changes their own attitude to Earth. We, we hope when people, when visitors come out from this exhibition, they have changed their attitude to nature and they change their attitude to, to the planet Earth. Therefore, yeah. so it's very important to understand. When you come in, you're not a tourist. You're an observer who observes, scientists who observe the planet Earth yeah, with highly technical instruments. When you come here, when the show is locally opened, you will also have people who guide you, who help you to understand. So it's really a Gedankenausstellung. It's a great social and epistemological uh, experiment. Therefore, I'm very happy now to show the film. Yeah, yeah. Please start the film. And then after, we can discuss together what we have seen. We are in 1986. I have just been born, but somewhere far away, a forest is dying. A worried forest guard calls a journalist from Geo magazine, who immediately travels to the forest. He raises the alarm, which sounds worldwide. A few kilometers further on, a geochemist gets the alarm call and travels to the site. A few months later, they think they know precisely why the trees are dying. The forester had indeed a lot to worry about. Two tons of sulfur were falling each year on the Vosch forest as acid rain. This was the starting point for the Steinbach Observatory.
In 2007, after long years of political debate, the amount of sulfur falling on the forest was reduced to 200 kg per year, resulting in a sharp decrease in acid rain. But all of a sudden, everything turned red again. The sulfur rate increased in the rains. Through the weather station, we learned that the pollution in the clouds that left Asia turned into acid rain here in less than 20 days under what can be called good weather conditions. A geochemist working on a high-frequency technology welcomes us to his in-situ lab, the River Lab. He shows us the chemicals in the river behaving in a turbulent way. Sodium and sulfate are following the same rhythm. Calcium is also rather predictable. But look at potassium. He's messing around. The geochemist explains his research. Imagine that the river is a bit of a symphony and using the b monthly sampling routine, we can listen to only one note of this symphony per minute. Thanks to the river lab, you can listen to all the notes and you can linger on the different music scores of this immense symphony. He has even started to assign sound frequencies to the movements of the elements. We contact a composer Would it be possible to hear the river as complex chemical composition in addition to the traditional numbers and curves?
Now you have seen the first view in our real exhibition in the real space of ZCAM. Behind you, what you've seen is precisely the Observatory of Strengbach, yeah? uh, built by Alessandra Aren and Sohail Hajibaba. And now I can welcome the two artists and also Marie-Claire Perret, yeah? uh, who gave a lecture uh, some time ago in the, at the seminar of Bruno Latour, a very fascinating lecture about the work and about the work of the observatory Strengbach. What is important to know, when you come in the show, we have, the show exists of two light yards, two floors, but not also on the ground floor. The show also happens in the first floor, because then you can see how everything is connected. And now I ask Bruno Latour, Bruno, please uh, tell us how it happened that you found Marie Claire Bray, how and why you selected Strengbach. Well, I think that it's Marie Claire who should explain in a better way uh, what the critical zone is. And the reason why I thought it was natural because it's on the other side of the border. I could not imagine that the border would be actually close between Germany and France, even though um, it had been closed for many, many centuries, but now it has been closed because of, a, of, a, of the COVID. Uh, and the reason is also because it's a very small, so it's a sort of, uh, sort of, canonic uh, ways of understanding what is an observatory is. And Marie-Claire accepted to help uh, Soel and Alexandra. So this is very simple. It's also for me one reason which is very important is that this is a site, an observatory, which was requested by citizens, which in the time of the, you remember the time of the acid rain, they were actually uh, asking for the, someone to study the reason of the acid rain uh, catastrophe. So it has lots of little advantages, but I will let uh, Marie-Claire explain and Alexandra and Soel account for the way they fell in love with the standback and transported it in the space here. Okay, uh, hello. Um, first of all, uh, I am uh, very, very happy to be uh, there tonight. And uh, thanks to technology, uh, because we can uh, stay connected despite of the coronavirus uh, context. So the adventure uh, began uh, two years ago about uh, by the visit of uh, first uh, Bruno and Alexandra. And then uh, Soel uh, came uh, many times, but also uh, many people from the uh, ZKM, uh, many artists, many uh, other people came to visit the site and uh, we share many, many times together and uh, we discuss a lot uh, together. And um, I, I try to explain uh, the, the, the nature of the observatory. So that's true that this observatory is a little um, a place, a small place, uh, one uh, kilometer square. Uh, so it's not a big uh, surface, a big area, but um, uh, the advantage of this small uh, size is that uh, we can uh, really uh, um, characterize and analyze all the compartments of the observatory, from the atmosphere, the canopy, the vegetation, the soils, the uh, the, the ground, the rocks, the old the hydrospheres, uh, the springs, the river, the streams. And that's very, very important because all these compartments are connected. And there is a lot of reaction between the different compartments, physical, chemical, biological reaction among them. And that's why we welcome since uh, 35 years a large community of uh, researchers from uh, many uh, various uh, disciplines, from the discipline from geoscience, discipline from uh, uh, chemistry, mathematics, uh, physics, but also uh, from social science. And uh, we uh, also have a, a strong link with the people from the village, with the association from the village, with uh, the, all the community. It's a large community of people who are working together to better understand uh, the functioning of this uh, ecosystems, which is part of the critical zone. 
and why it's important because in this uh, area uh, the challenge the main challenge are the future and uh, of the water resource especially because in the context of climatic change the the, the resource can be uh, in danger and the future of uh, uh, a sustainable development of forest so we are working all together uh, and uh, that's uh, probably one of the reason why uh, the research are uh, working uh, uh, from uh, since uh, 1986. Very clear. From where do you speak now? Where are, where are you, Magdalene? Where are you situated? Are you now in Strengbach? So the the Strengbach is the name of the small river. And uh, the, the observatory is uh, located in a small village, the highest uh, elevated uh, village uh, from uh, Alsace. The name of the village is Aubur. It's a small village uh, for about uh, 400, less than 400 uh, people who are living there. And they, uh, the, the drinking water they use part is coming from the, the site we are studied. People work in the observatory. How many people work in your observatory? Oh, it's a, a, a complex question. Ah, Bruno. No, I, I, I just wanted to make a comment. Uh, I mean, you will answer on the question of Peter, but <clears throat> it's very interesting to compare the sort of science, the sort of equipment the sort of detailed knowledge on a very small part with what people have in mind when uh, you talk about earth science, because earth science is about the globe. So, but the globe viewed globally. And what is interesting is what is done here is of course to do it very, very, at a very, very small scale to feed all of the models which are uh, studying the earth uh, globally. This was just a comment. I'm sorry, I intervened in the conversation. Yes, it's a very important and um, yes, very important point of view uh, to know that we are working at different scale from the uh, atom scale to the, sc the satellite observation scales. We are working also to the uh, large scale of time from nanosecond processes to, to uh, millennium, millennium processes. And uh, Bruno is completely right. Uh, this small uh, uh, place, uh, multidisciplinary research are uh, working together in this small place where uh, you can study in detail all the compartments of the ecosystems. Uh, all the uh, and all the processes you can uh, precisely characterize the processes the nature of the compartment the their characteristics and this is uh, um, uh, and this is relevant because uh, in this uh, small piece of land uh, represent the reference of all other similar systems around the world. So the strength bar catchment is a reference around the world concerning the um, middle altitude forested uh, place where the, the, the sustainability of water and the sustainability of forest, because without water all the year or without good health forest, the, the life is not possible. The, the people could not stay in a place where in the future there is some uh, risk concerning the availability of water. That's why it's very, very important and it's one of the, ch the societal challenge uh, for what we are working. Alexander Sohe, uh, uh, critical zone is a highly complex scientific subject. So my question is, how could you conceive to turn it into an installation that people will understand? Do you hear me? Yes. So at first, before um, um, answering to your question, I have to say a huge thank to everybody who helped us in this long and fantastic journey 
um, of field work, encounters. Uh, we it's two years and a half of work of uh, passion, passionate work. Uh, we me, we met many people who are scientists, uh, artists, and curators. You, Peter, Bruno. Uh, we discussed a lot and we have to say thank thank to you thank to all of you and thank to all the people who who hear us now mamnoun az hame iraniyay ke mar mar mibinan and uh, merci à tous les français aussi um so uh, the first the, the first issue was to uh, the project well when we started the project began with one issue um, how uh, can the Strangeback Observatory uh, be shown in the museum, in the space of the museum? That was the first issue. And when we started working on it, a, a second issue arrived and it was how to share, maybe. Yeah, it was uh, how to share this feed experience because as you said, Peter, it's a complex, the critical zone observatory, the critical zone science is very complex. And it was a big challenge uh, to um, be able to show it in an understandable way. So I don't know if it's work with a digital tour, uh, but what you see basically uh, in the video was the Stramba Observatory, so the watershed, which is a geolo geological unit that you say behind us. Uh, yeah, we work on models and, and so to, to put this um, landscape into the space of the ZKM. And it fits uh, pretty well uh, because of the shape and the altitude. And we can ke uh, keep, uh, in a way, uh, the altitude and the instrumented station. And what was important is not to, uh, to show the landscape at, as a, the traditional way, uh, with uh, the shape of a river or the shape of a tree or a mountain, but uh, to show uh, it through the lens of the instruments uh, and the, uh, the monitoring uh, landscape. Uh, that's why uh, you don't see uh, basically the, the geomorphological geo uh, profile of the terrain, but you see in the space only uh, the instruments and only where the scientists uh, can uh, understand what is going on uh, in the depth of the critical zone or uh, what, uh, what are the atmospheric movement or where is uh, the water. And it's a very uh, composing thing, uh, composition uh, with uh, artistic matter, materials and scientific images. And uh, I do say the challenge was to, uh, to put it into the same space and to see what happens. It's a huge assemblage. It's a huge composition. And what you see, Peter, uh, Barbara, Dominica, uh, and Annette, what you, what you see just behind you, this huge uh, skeleton hanged behind you, uh, it's, uh, the, it comes from where uh, Sylvain or geophysicists uh, see the, what happened under the soil. The, and the idea was the, the or aim well, uh, came from when you enter in the natural museum at first when you arrive in the central hall you see something majestic something uh, fascinating a, a, a whale skeleton or a dinosaur skeleton and what you see be, just behind your your back um, it's the skeleton of the strange bar and where and only where we know something about what happened deep under the underground. We have one question for the collaboration between Marie Claire, who is on the scientist side and the artist uh, side, uh, where simultaneously we have an architect who is actually doing sociology of science and the other one who is doing architecture because we have a series of models here. And I'd like to know the very audacious idea that Alexandra and Soil had, which is to say, we are not going to show, to, to, to show the landscape in the traditional way, landscapes, which by the way, is shown in another part of the exhibition through 
19th century and 18th century painting. We are not going to do that. We are extracting just what the scientists see. So it's a very audacious way because it's just like when you go into an emergency room and you see only the, the sort of inside body that you didn't know you have. So this is my question to my Claire. I'd like to know what it feels to see your own baby, so to speak, <laughs> and that, uh, shown through x-rays made by architects. I mean, it's a very strange situation in addition because we are not in the space we have a model made by uh, Alexandra, and so it is visible. Okay, we, uh, probably we can respond uh, all, <laughs> Alexandra and Soel uh, and me. Uh, probably the, the most important key was that we were able to meet many times and spend time um, along, many times together. Uh, we we are going to the site, we discuss a lot, and this is probably the first uh, most important point to, uh, work, to be able to have time together, to be able to discuss, to be able to go on the site uh, several times and feel the, feel the things, feel the, the, the situation, feel the, the ecosystems, feel the, the respiration of the things, and we discuss, uh, I learn a lot from uh, Soil and Alexandra, the way that Alexandra uh, uh, work to represent the critical zone was very instructive for me. And, and this uh, uh, exchange, this uh, come, uh, come back uh, during discussion between them and us, uh, because of that, we were able to construct something together, but the architect and the artist was not the scientist. The scientists give some piece of things, of uh, understanding, of questions, and uh, they build, they have ideas, they, uh, they, uh, they, they keep our understanding and they build their own, uh, their own uh, uh, construction, but uh, I, I was very impressed uh, by the ability to uh, understand and learn so fast the things. For example, Alexandra uh, learned a lot about what we, the life cycle of elements, what we call the biogeochemical cycle of elements, and she worked a lot about sulfur cycle, uh, uh, hydrogen cycles, carbon cycles, and calcium cycles, and it's not so easy. It's really uh, a geochemist uh, uh, things, and uh, she draw, uh, she, she draw a map uh, concerning the, the these cycles. Uh, uh, including all the scale of the ecosystem and also including the time evolution of the cycles. And that I was so impressed by, uh, by all the work they, they made. I would, like, I would like to confirm what Bruno has said. It was very audacious, but the achievement is very, is very grandiose because on one side, it's the installation, very beautiful, huh? nearly too beautiful. It's a wonderful architecture and a wonderful installation. Huh? But on the other side, it is also a visualization of scientific data, very solid. So when you walk through this installation, you can really learn what Bruno has said. The patient, the landscape is not visible. This is underneath some cover, huh? but the instruments who control the patient, the scientific instruments and the data you can see. Huh? And when you're in the installation, on the first floor you see romantic patents. And you see the illusion 200 years ago, human nature untouched by, uh, nature untouched by human hand. Now you see the opposite. Huh? Uh, nature touched all the time by human hands and human instruments. And therefore I'm very grateful that you achieved uh, this, uh, con con this fusion of science and art. Huh? Thank you. Bruno? Peter, since we are uh, in different space and behind Alexandra and Soel, there are two different scale models. Yeah. I would love if they could take their computer and show it better to us, if you, if you agree. Yeah. Because it's, it's, it's a bit sad not to see the baby 
and, 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 and the, the baby is simultaneously behind you in ZKM, but it's also behind them in, 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 the, in their studio. So would you allow them to show us better the, 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 the thing or not? Yes, yes, very good idea, Bruno. Please take your computer and go to the baby, please. Uh, we can't move the computer, but we will try to, yeah. to move come the, close to the object. We will, we will try to go, to go close to there. Okay. Yeah, this is uh, actually the scale model that we, you, we, uh, we will put uh, into the space of the ZKM. Uh, and this is... Yeah, maybe you see better now. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a form of the geomorphology, this is this is of the, like and this is here, uh, which is a, the stream, the Schremba, and the stations are scattered uh, on the observatory. And so this uh, is about 80 hectares, 80 hectares, and an altitude at 200 meters, if I'm, I'm right. <laughs> and there is something very interesting. If we consider that the strange back, the strange back is the scale one behind you, you have the strange back observatory 40 times smaller. There, that's it. This piece is the last piece we will travel with it when you will open your door to public and then the borders will open. This, this, this model is 400 time smaller and this one is 80 800 small so um, we we so, we started by this one okay let's represent strange bar like that but we see nothing we, we see really nothing yeah because it's we don't see block. through this concrete it's earth concrete it's very bio based bio -ba eco bio based uh, material but we don't really see nothing beside you behind you on in all these instruments, you see things. We don't know what, but we little by little, step by step, we will learn things. Yeah, because uh, in each uh, part of the installation, in each station, there is you can get data and information, uh, and it's uh, thanks to the scientists that uh, we're able to do that. Oh, the, 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 I'm not sure that Marie Claire can recognize its baby with so many different instances, a small baby, mid baby, big baby. But what is important is that it, the whole idea of a, of a small, of a modeling, to, we have to convince the visitors of a show, and that's the issue, that uh, when they see a landscape, they don't see more of what happens than when we look at a body without the instrument when we are in a, in a hospital. And the problem is that the skin is in a hospital in some sense. And that's one of the meaning of a critical zone. So we are very grateful to Marie-Claire Pierre to have given his, <laughs> if I can say that, given her body to science, so to speak, or given <laughs> her baby to science, and to have uh, Alexandra and Soil making uh, an X-rays of them, because that's exactly the lesson we wanted to, to get at. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Alexander. Thank you, Marie Claire. Thank you, Zohe, yeah, for these insights and the explanations concerning your installation. Thank you so much. Yeah. So, this was an introduction to the first uh, room. And now we, I sh we show you another dialogical guided tour through other sections of the exhibition. This exhibition will have different sections. And our co curators, like uh, Martin Genard, like Bettina Korintenberg and Daria Mille, so they give you short examples uh, and introduce you in the different sections. I start with Martin Genard, he's co curator of this exhibition, and also together with Bruno Latour, he's co curator of the famous Taipei Biennale in, us, in Asia. Uh. So please, Martin, please start with the film uh, and give your commentary. So this is a section called We Don't Live Where We Are, and then Ghost Takers. And of course, it's kind of counterintuitive as a title. Why would we say, why would we ask, make this statement to say that we do not live where we are? 
Well, it's because there is a, a kind of disconnection that we want to emphasize, which is the disconnection between the place where our body physically is, the territory where, let's say, we go for our groceries, where our offices are, where our house are. Uh, in case of a lockdown and COVID, it's mainly where your house, house is, of course. And the territory from which we draw resources from, uh, the territory from which we live, pretty much. And so this section is kind of um, an extension of the notion of footprint, if you want. But where we're really going to work with artists who are very specific about this question of, of, uh, of the materials which are, you know, which are sucked in within, uh, from one remote territory within our daily lives. Whether it's with Uriel Orlo, for example, who's working on the colonial history of agriculture, mainly how uh, between France and Germany there were colonial agricultures which were put within Africa in order to feed Europe. He's retracing that kind of lineage from there to this day. Or with the work of uh, Julien Charrière, which is actually a prospective work, which is uh, dealing with how rare earth, min rare earth minerals, which are used to fuel our kind of digital technologies, are likely to launch some sorts of, uh, of uh, exploitation and intensive extractions within the future in uh, Bolivia. So we're kind of doing this bridge between our, our, our past and our future with different artworks which are all kind of trying to articulate this notion which was very useful for us of this notion of ghost acres. And so ghost acres, it's, it's a term which was coined by the historian Kenneth Pomerantz who explains how in the 18th century, Britain, which was pretty much like approximately at the same level as, uh, as uh, Japan and China, completely took off in terms of, of uh, development because it was capable of benefiting from, on the one hand, the coal, but also from its colonies, from like vast amounts of lands, which were, which were pretty much providing it with like cheap goods and cheap work. And so it's a term that which he coined because the, the, the British who, you know, on a domestic level were kind of model of democracy, etc., were benefiting from these colonies, from kind of like ghost lands, which were very far away, but which were fueling their prosperity in the present, which were invisible and yet were present into their daily lives. So the connection with the critical zone, of course, is that if we need to relocate ourselves, if we need to draw the new coordinates of the space in which we are, it's absolutely essential to kind of figure out what are the boundaries of the territory in which we're nested. So this is a section which is curated by the historian of art, Joseph Leo Kerner and which has been made possible thanks to the very generous loans of the, of the Kunsthalle in Karlsruhe, which is going to deal with, with the Erdkunde, and on that I have to apologize for my bad accent, but Erdkunde, which could be translated as Earth Tindings. And so what we mean by that is pretty much it's, it's a term which was used by the Romantics, painters and scientists alike, to describe how the earth is sending to us certain kind of signals and that if you really pay attention you would be able to or at least you the, the romantic painter or scientist would be able to decipher them if again he goes through what kerner describes as a sort of like epiphany which is this moment of extreme awareness where the earth would send a signal but which wouldn't be sort of homogeneous each specific moment, each specific time, each specific place would create a sort of signal which the artist would be able to retranscribe. And so, of course, for us it's interesting in terms of um, the critical zone because let's say that this kind of regime of attention to a very local place on how you could kind of observe the, the certain specific phenomenon which are arising from it is very interesting. And also there's there's a point which Kerner makes, which is that Romanticism, kind of 
at least the art uh, after the 19th century was kind of classified as over the top very quickly or, or became sentimental, as uh, you would say. Uh, whereas the romantic science, which had a very anti-reductionist approach, were kind of like lost against more reductivist propositions. But today, like this kind of vision, which is uh, pretty much very much about connections, about holistic approach, about interconnectedness, is kind of regaining some forms of attention. And so that's the reason why it was very important for us to include this sort of like historical background, which really uh, is kind of entering into resonance with the practice of the critical Zionists today. The next section will be introduced by Daria Mille, who is a member of the curatorial team. Please show us her contribution. We live inside Gaia. We are following the steps of James Lovelock. So we have learned today that we are enfolded in the critical zone, but that's not enough. We also live inside Gaia. But what is Gaia? To understand this, in the exhibition we are tracing the groundbreaking research of two scientists, of James Lavelock and Lynn Margulis. James Lavelock was originator of the Gaia hypothesis and Lynn Margulis its co-developer. So James Lavelock, uh, he is engineer, he is chemist, he is inventor, and he's, he became famous for his um, experiments with um, a detection of uh, pollution particles. In the 60s, he was invited uh, to NASA and uh, conducted their several experiments. And one of them was um, the idea of building a little device to uh, basically detect life on Mars. Uh, but James Lovelock didn't need to travel to Mars. He uh, just um, said that basically we can detect uh, life on a planetary scale uh, when we analyze the chemical composition of the atmosphere. Um, and um, in opposite to the Earth, where the um, atmosphere was in a steady disequilibrium, uh, the atmosphere on Mars was very uh, equilibrial. Uh, and uh, starting from there, he said, no, there is no um, life on Mars. So the Gaia hypothesis was formed in the late 60s and at the beginning of 70s. And uh, it says uh, that the chemical composition of the atmosphere is basically steadily uh, sustained in a, a dynamic disequilibrium. And it's uh, sustained in this disequilibrium by the uh, life forms. And also if life forms can affect and can influence the chemical composition of the atmosphere, then they probably can even control and regulate the climate uh, in order to create favorable conditions to sustain life on Earth. The contributor of uh, the Gaia hypothesis was also Lynn Margulis. And what did she contribute to this idea? Uh, Margulis was a microbiologist and she added the aspect of deep time. At the time she entered the story, uh, Lovelock uh, saw that uh, he is dealing with an encompassing uh, whole system uh, with a cybernetic model, uh, but he didn't really know where the variation in the gases came from. And uh, Lynn Margulis contributed uh, her knowledge about, the, how, about how microbes uh, basically change and affect uh, the atmosphere and also affect different layers in the surface of our planet. So uh, Lovelock was looking uh, on Gaia from above, so to speak, from uh, the atmosphere and uh, Lynn Margulis was looking from uh, the very little things, from how um, basically uh, bacteria uh, formed um, the uh, biosphere of the early life on the planet. So Gaia is quite a surprising concept uh, because now we really understand that in order to uh, study, in order to understand the material world in the critical zone, we have to understand how life forms behave. And that every element in the critical zone, water, rocks, atmosphere, and further different elements, uh, they have been transformed by the life forms themselves. 
Uh, and uh, this is a shift from nature into Gaia, where we found ourselves on a completely different territory where we understand the life forms uh, form uh, the material world around us. And I would like to uh, conclude with a little quote from the book uh, The Vanishing Face of Gaia by James Lovelock. Perhaps the greatest value of the Gaia concept lies in its metaphor of a living Earth, which reminds us that we are part of it and that our contract with Gaia is not about human rights alone, but includes human obligations. The next section, the next section will be introduced by Bettina Gründenberg, another co-creator, and she will follow the ideas, especially of Bruno Latour, becoming terrestrial and national history today. With the arrival of the Gaia theory by Lovelock and Margulis, life itself comes into focus to understand what makes the Earth so unique and so different from all the other planets. And to think alongside the Margulis means to rethink the basic assumptions of life and evolution. And herewith, we move into the section we have called Natural History Today, in which Margulis and her thoughts and practice are key. Margulis' rediscovery and uh, further development of the endosymbiotic theory in the 1970s introduced a major change in evolution theory, questioning natural selection, gene mutation and adaption as the main drivers in evolution. The endosymbiotic theory now has ample evidence to show that all animals, fungi and plants descend from a series of bacterial mergers, thus the coming together of previously different bacteria to form complex nucleated cells. Margulis emphasizes symbiosis as the major force to introduce novelty in evolution as co-evolution. Margulis' view of the Earth as a symbiotic planet, as she herself writes, opens up a totally different understanding of the world we live in and ultimately of ourselves. No single entity exists sealed in itself. Everywhere are symbiotic connections that make life possible. For example, more than 10,000 different bacteria live inside the human gut and help to shape our experience of digestion and nutrition in the world. And for this symbiotic state of being, Margulis coined the term of the holobiont to describe and to understand life forms through their interdependencies and um, entanglements as consortia rather than as individuals. And within this section, we also revisit natural history museums as artifacts, which played a decisive role in mediating and popularizing our perception of and our relation to what we are used to call the natural world. And in their foundational period, natural history museums were informed by a modern scientific view promoting a nature-culture divide and localizing man apart from and hierarchically above nature. Specimens from all over the world were collected and put inside the museum space, extracted from their environment and presented in a mute way, categorized in a taxonomic order. And in times of massive extinction of species and the habitats, it comes into question what is the responsibility of natural history museums today? Might there be a change from an articulation and understanding of conservation of species from um, displaying extinct species to a practice of care and custodianship to preserve species from extinction? Those are questions that the artists in the section are posing. They also uh, reflect on the history of the natural history museums as well as on a holobiontic existence 
which narrates vital codependencies and entanglements, including humans, and calling for different stories and prospects to come. And to commonly collect and make up alternative stories, stories of earthly survival, as Donna Haraway puts it, as well as practices to inhabit the earth with an awareness of its sensitivity to our actions, informs the last section, becoming terrestrial. Becoming terrestrial means a process of becoming with, and it is a task that only can be done collectively with a multiplicity of agents and voices. And herefore, we have joined forces with a lot of local initiatives, um, public and private actors, activists, entrepreneurs, scientists and artists, as well as the participants from the Critical Zone Study Group at the Karlsruhe University of Arts and Design. And collectively, we try to find ways to build up assemblies and modes of becoming terrestrial. And we invite the visitors to participate in this process by shared actions and activities that will run during the course of the exhibition and hopefully beyond that.